All right, hello everyone. Welcome to my channel. I'm Thomas and I do educational videos and uh, today is number 108 on the reciprocal system of theory. And the reciprocal system of theory is a theory of everything devised by Dewey B. Larson and um, he was working on that uh, throughout the 20th century from about 1930 until his death back uh, in 1990. Uh, we're looking at his final book that came out posthumously in 1995 called Beyond Space and Time. And this is his attempt to get into metaphysics, philosophy, religion, psychology, uh, whereas his earlier books were all on hard sciences. Um, and uh, the basic gist of the reciprocal system is that uh, Larson is positing a universe of motion. That is, the universe is not made out of matter, and it's not made out of energy, but it is made out of motion. Matter and energy are merely kinds of motion, uh, as is every other scientific phenomena uh, that you can think of. Uh, they are all uh, fundamentally made out of motion. And for Larson, motion was the relationship between space and time. Really, a re the reciprocal relationship between space and time. Space and time are reciprocals of each other. They have no uh, real existence other than together in motion. Uh, you don't have space or time separate from one another uh, unless you're abstracting them. Uh, they come together in motion. And they are the same as each other, except they are inverted. And so, uh, just like three halves and two thirds are inverted. Uh, that's what you have to do to get from the realm of space to the realm of time. Um, but really, the realm is not exactly right because for Larson, uh, space and time are not the container of the universe as we usually think of space as kind of being the container where uh, events happen. Um, but for Larson, space and time are the contents of the universe. So not a container, but the contents. And um, what we know about space, we also know about time and vice versa. And uh, what we do know about space is that it's three or more dimensions, and therefore time is also three or more dimensions. Larson refers to this as coordinate space and coordinate time. And then what we know about time is that it's always progressing. It's always getting later and later and later. So therefore, space is also doing the same thing. It's getting uh, later, uh, getting further and further apart. Um, the progression of space or the flow of space or the recession of the distant galaxies. Uh, and that is what Larson calls clock time and clock space. And uh, also space and time are um, in discrete units only. They're, conti they're not continuous, uh, but they come in chunks. Uh, and when you have one chunk of space and one chunk of time, uh, one over one, uh, really uh, that is what Larson refers to as the speed of light. So the speed of light is one unit of time, one unit of space and one unit of time. And that is the uh, kind of the background or the uh, null point or the neutral point, the midpoint, the origin of the universe, whereas in Einstein's world, uh, the speed of light was the maximum speed of the universe. But for Larson, there's an entire half of the universe that's actually moving faster than the speed of light. He calls that the cosmic sector or sector one, or I'm sorry, sector two. And the sector one is the half of the universe that's moving slower than the speed of light, which he calls the material sector. And this uh, sector one is what we are normally familiar with, which uh, grows and aggregates through um, bonding. And 
uh, gets up to its most complex level, which is the DNA molecule. And at that level, uh, the DNA molecule becomes eligible to be controlled by a sector 2 entity. And uh, when that happens, we have what Larson calls the life unit. And so the life unit starts out with uh, your single-celled organisms and um, develops and evolves through uh, various means, but uh, up until its most complex level, which is, for Larson, the intelligent human being. And at that point, the intelligent human being becomes eligible to be taken control of by a, an entity from Sector 3. And Sector 3, for Larson, is the uh, region that is beyond space and time or independent of space and time. And that is uh, what I would point to as being that speed of light, uh, being that uh, origin. Um, and the origin or this metaphysical region, Sector 3, for Larson, is always good. And it communicates with human beings that are under its influence. Um, and it is always correct. Uh, what it does communicate through various channels such as ESP, uh, intuition, religious revelation, and scientific insight. Uh, the problem is that human beings are merely uh, spiritual, uh, analogous to spiritual single-celled organisms. We're just starting on our path, spiritual path. We just became eligible to receive these messages. And so we're not quite adept yet at decoding these messages or understanding these messages. Uh, some of us more than others, some at some times more than others, uh, and some messages are more complex than others. The simple intuitions that we all get, um, those are more reliable than the more complex scientific insights and religious revelations, which take a great deal of preparedness and dedication and concentration to be able to, um, to understand fully. And uh, that's really what the topic of his final book, Beyond Space and Time, is, is, is about Sector 3 phenomena. And uh, we are in uh, the 26th chapter. I think the book only has 28 chapters, so we're getting toward the end. And it is called, this chapter is called uh, uh, The Road Ahead. And um, so he was just talking about, uh, you know, he's, he's really trying to put religion on a uh, scientific footing through the reciprocal system and, um, you know, kind of uh, eliminate all the chaff from the religions, the, what he calls the archaic, uh, y you know, uh, add-ons to the religious and to get down to what is really the core about the religion, which for Larson is the Sector 3, and the moral code, which is really kind of like a composite of all of the different uh, communications from Sector 3. So we're going to catch him right here in the middle of this chapter, and we'll see where he goes. It is no accident that the trend toward political activism coincides with a deep uneasiness about the message and the mission of religion. When long-range objectives are not clear and distinct, there is always a tendency to substitute some short-range goals that can be really readily defined. The social gospel that we now hear so much about is simply humanism under another name. More and more often, it is proclaimed from the pulpit that the objective of religion is to make the world a better place to live in. Now, uh, if, if you've been following me, uh, he talked, uh, he had a whole chapter about humanism earlier and pointed out that humanism is really kind of like a, again, another sector two uh, thing that kind of uh, masquerades as being uh, sector three. Okay, um, 
and he calls mostly, uh, you know, most of the decisions that humans make are economic or social decisions that don't have any sector three ramifications. They're not moral decisions, but they are social or economic. Okay, back to Larson. This is, of course, a very commendable objective, one that has all of, all of us can approve. Whether or not it is a religious objective is an altogether different question. The transcendental religions has, have always held that man exists for a purpose that is far more significant than living a good life on earth, and that an activity is religious, or at least has religious aspects, if it contributes to the fulfillment of that purpose. It is probable, however, that the present trend toward social gospel is largely due to an increasing awareness among church leaders that they have no clear idea as to what the purpose of human life actually is. In the words of their respective creeds, which differ but little in this respect, it is to accomplish the will of God. But the crucial question is, just what does this mean? Alongside the vague and conflicting answers that are supplied by the various organized religions, the simple and believable assertions of the humanists that life in this world can be improved and that we ought to try to improve it are definitely attractive. And it is not surprising that there has been a general shift in the direction of accepting this as a religious goal. Embracing the theology of the picket line. The point that does not appear to have been given adequate consideration by those who have accepted the humanist thesis is that this leaves them without any distinctly religious objective. In effect, it makes religion superfluous. Many other agencies are working toward social and economic betterment, either intentionally or as a byproduct of their efforts toward other objectives. The economist, for instance, defines his objective in identically the same terms as those employed in stating the aims of the social gospel. The purpose of economics, he says, is to make the world a better place in which to live. Furthermore, many of these non-religious agencies are doing this job much more effectively than the religious organizations. For instance, it, the inventors of labor-saving devices and the industrial organizations that work out methods of manufacturing those devices at a cost that is within reach of the general public probably do more to make life pleasant for the average individual than the social gospel ever accomplishes. The same can be said of those individuals and organizations whose efforts are directed toward making new and better medicines available to minimize the physical ills of mankind. If social and economic betterment is adopted as the religious objective, then the religious organizations are simply joining in an activity in which many other agencies of society are participating. They are taking part and only a minor part at that, in what is primarily a secular activity. That is sector two. Past experience suggests that this policy may have some very undesirable long-range consequences. It is not difficult to see a rather close parallel between the social welfare activities on which the churches are now embarking more and more freely and the secular functions undertaken by the religions of earlier eras. The functions that are responsible for the present condition in which the genuine religi religious doctrines are smothered under an overburden of anachronistic rules of conduct. There is a disturbing similarity between the early day identification of godliness with conformity to diet regulations and today's identification of the will of God with support of some particular social or economic program. Today, as in the distant past, the short-term advantages of utilizing the authority of religion as a secular tool are self-evident. 
just as those who were trying to enforce diet, sanitation, and other health regulations in primitive communities found it expedient to incorporate these regulations into the religious codes, so those who are trying to make changes in present-day social and economic conditions find it expedient to enlist the aid of the churches and to portray their objectives as part of the divine plan. But the long-term results of the first secularization have been disastrous. The mixing of secular and religious ideas and activities has confused the situation to the point where neither priest nor layman is now able to distinguish between them, a fact that has contributed very materially materially to the decline in religious influence that is admittedly becoming serious. Religious organizations have made a serious mistake in attempting to enforce a social code as part of the moral code. When the social conditions change, as they inevitably do, many of the principles of the previously formulated social code become inapplicable, if not completely ridiculous. The religious attempts to continue enforcing these provisions as part of the moral code then have the effect of discrediting morality in general and producing the valuelessness that is now a matter of acute concern. There is no reason to believe that the effects of the present day tendency toward further secularization of religion will be any less damaging in the long run. In any event, the findings of this present work now define the issues more clearly and should enable a reassessment of the situation, not only by the religious organizations, but also by those individuals who are sufficiently concerned to want to evaluate these issues for themselves. The basic fact that has been uncovered is that the transcendental religions are correct in their assertions that there is a purpose in human existence and that this purpose is defined by agencies outside the space-time universe, that is Sector 3. It then follows that these religions are also correct in their contention that the primary objective of religion is to aid in the fulfillment of that purpose. The essential contribution which the present work has made toward clarification of the situation is a definite identification of the purpose of human existence, which has hitherto been only vaguely understood. The purpose for which the entire universe, including the human race, exists, we find, is to build ethical personalities that is, to perfect the rudimentary Sector 3 components that enter into the structures of men and other intelligent biological organisms in extraterrestrial locations. We may then define religious activities as though those that are aimed directly at the accomplishment of this basic purpose. It is clear that the humanistic goal of making the world a better place in which to live does not come within this definition, since it makes no direct contribution to the primary purpose of existence. It therefore cannot be considered a religious objective, however praiseworthy it may, uh, from some, may seem from, other stand, uh, from some other standpoint. Improving the conditions of life on earth does have some indirect effect on progress toward the purpose of existence, since, as we have already noted, the individual who leads a comfortable and trouble-free life has more opportunity and more inclination to perfect his ethical personality than one who is continually harassed by the everyday problems of living. But in view of our observation that most of the improvements in living conditions that are being made today are results of the activities of agencies and organizations that cannot be considered religious in any sense of the term, it is clear that we cannot stretch the definition of religious far enough to include humanistic goals. Humanism is directed toward happiness. This is desirable from a human standpoint, to be sure, but as brought out earlier, it is irrelevant from the standpoint of the ultimate purpose of life. 
Thus, humanism is not a religion, nor a substitute for a religion, nor even a component of religion. It is a fair question to ask whether any religious organization can carry on an extensive program directed at the objectives of humanism or other secular ends and at the same time do justice to its religious responsibilities. As Paul Tillich warns, acceptance of secularism can lead to a slow elimination of the religious dimension altogether. Uh, back to Larson. In, it, in as much as the religious objective, building the building of moral character, is the most significant aspect of human existence, the only one that is anything more than transient, we should uh, should we not have some sort of an organization, if not the present religious bodies, then something else that would devote its full energies to this most difficult and important task? We are uh, told uh, the church cannot afford to be irrelevant. It must address itself to the crucial problems of the day if it wishes to attract people. But in diverting their attention to the crucial problems of the day, uh, secular problems mainly, the churches are diverting their attention away from the crucial problems of human existence the religious problems. They are converting the church from a religious organization to a secular institution. If the church is to survive as a significant influence in the world of tomorrow, it must, in the world, uh, it must begin to take itself seriously as a religious community. It cannot afford to abandon its religious mission in order to attract people, even if it were successful in that aim. Um, okay, I guess we'll stop there. We'll Pick it up tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in. See you tomorrow, hopefully.